Hey everyone, thanks so much for taking a minute to watch this video. I really wanted to put together something that would give you an overview of, at this stage, what we feel like God's calling me and Sarah and our family to. Uh, there's been a few videos leading up until this that have gone into detail about the journey that we've been on, and I'll make sure to link to those in the description if you want a little more backstory. But what I wanted to share in this video was basically what God is calling us to or at least what he's calling us to as far as we know at this stage. We continue just to be open for the move of the Spirit. We want to remain humble and not really feel like we have it all figured out because we really don't. But there are some kind of clear directions that God is leading us in. And so this is the start of our new journey and a little bit of a an overview of what we feel like he's calling us into. First thing is we really feel two primary focuses in this upcoming season. The first one would be the the planting of the church in Phoenix. Now, when most people think of a church plant, they have something that that comes to their mind of a traditional process, you know, starting in a living room, building momentum, buying a building, developing an organization, all of that. We're going at it a bit differently, and we're really doing a lot of experimenting right now on what exactly this is supposed to look like, and we'll get into that a little bit more. The second part that we really feel God calling us to is to, con to continue with what he's already established uh, with the Revive and Awaken ministry, which is the discipleship platform that we use to share the gospel, to share revelation and teaching from the Bible, and really to be able to equip people to, to carry out the mission that God has for their life. But let's start out here with focus number one, which is the Phoenix Church Plant. Now, I wanted to make this a bit interactive. Uh, instead of me just telling you what to think, I wanted you to think for yourself. And so I've got questions uh, interspersed throughout this entire time uh, that I'm shooting this video. So if you'd like, feel free to go ahead, push the pause button, think through it a little bit, uh, and then we'll kind of get to some of the, the answers or what we believe are some potential solutions to the questions that we pose. So the first question is this, how do you think the percentage of people attending church has shifted over the last decade, and this specifically is for the church in America. So if you'd like, go ahead, pause, and think through this a little bit. Well, here's the answer. Weekly church attendance, as you can see, has been plummeting, uh, specifically this past decade. And this even is prior to COVID. If you're looking at the graphic right now, you'll see that it was actually 2017 prior to COVID that we hit an all-time low of 27% of weekly church attendance. And if you look you know, at 2009, you'll see 48%. So there has been a dramatic shift in the negative direction for people coming to church. Now, it's not just about who's come or, or the numbers of people who are coming to church, but specifically the generations of people that are coming to church too. If this upcoming generation truly is our future, then it's going to be very important for us to recognize what's actually uh, drawing them to church or what's hindering them from church. And here's just a little bit of a uh, an observation of what's happening. As you can see here, the millennials are the lowest percentage uh, of weekly church attendance. And you can see that progressively from each generation, as you go down this list, less and less people are coming to church, which brings about the question, why do you think church attendance continues to plummet with millennials having the lowest percentage of churchgoers? Now, I believe there are a lot of answers to this question and more than what I'm able to cover right here, but here are some possible diagnoses that that I have made that, that me and this church planting team, we've made together as we're considering how we might shift some things when it comes to the planting of a new expression of church. Right at the forefront, you'll see societal irrelevance. Really, I think a lot of young people and really <laughs> I've, I've met even older people are, are starting to question what's the point? Many people see the church and Christianity really as irrelevant to their life. 
Another thing that we've diagnosed is that there are some organizational limitations in the current way that we do church. Now, I want to be careful here. I'm not I'm not saying that all forms of church that currently exist are wrong or bad. I think God is using them and there's beautiful fruit. But I think even if you talk to the pastors of these churches, they will they will let you know that there are some limitations, that there are some ways uh, that improvements can be made. And so that's really what we're honing in on right now is, okay, how can we how can we take what we currently have and how can we look at it at a different angle and how can we really shift some things dynamically to reach this new generation? And then finally, I think there's just a transformational deficiency. And, and what I mean by that is people are wondering, wondering where is the life-changing power of the church or really of faith? Unfortunately, we have a lot of uh, spectator Christians right now and lukewarm Christians to the point where it's sometimes difficult to really distinguish between a believer and a non-believer when it comes to their daily life. Sure, someone can go to church on Sunday, but but what does that actually mean? What is that actually doing for them? And so non-believers are seeing believers becoming increasingly lukewarm, increasingly compromising on values that, that are, are strong to our faith and are really wondering why go and spend a couple hours at church on Sunday if it's not going to really do anything to change my life. And so with that, I think we must come to the conclusion that what we're called to do, at least me and my family and the group that we're joining, is not to reproduce the current expression of church. Because as we can see, it is not producing the fruit uh, that is needed specifically for the younger generation, but really like we, like we showed before, across the board. And so I really love this quote by Albert Einstein that I think brings into focus uh, really what we're embodying here. Albert Einstein said, it's sanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And that's not what we want to do. We don't want to replicate the current expression of church. Like I said, I'm not saying that all of it's bad, but there are ways that we need to begin to think differently to be able to reach a new generation and really a new society. And so that's really what's at the tip of the spear here as we're considering this. So this leads us into our next question. What needs to change in order for the church to become a culture-shifting force in the world? Go ahead, pause the video, take a minute to really think about that. What do you think needs to change in order for us to begin to gain ground and momentum in America uh, specifically, but really the church in the West in general? Well, after thinking through these questions and really uh, spending a lot of time in prayer and and considering these in deep ways individually and with other people, here's a few solutions uh, that we've come up with that would differ a little bit from the current way uh, that that we're doing church. Now, this is by no means a completely exhaustive. There are so many different dynamics that we could look at, plenty of great things that the current, you know, traditional church is doing right now, and plenty of other things that probably could use a little bit of improvement. But this is kind of a, a good breakdown of a few that, that are really, really important. The first one is cultural significance. We want to operate in a way that reaches people in modern society now, here comes the really important part, without compromising biblical integrity. Here's not here's what I don't want you to hear me say right now. What I don't want you to hear me say is that we are going to, you know, throw everything to the side and do whatever it takes to reach this culture. That's not biblical. That's not the way that we want to live. No, first and foremost, we stand on the truth of Scripture. So what I'm not advocating right now for is a seeker-sensitive expression of church. I'm also not advocating for a watered-down gospel that is just fully inclusive trying to get everyone in the doors. No, we're, we're not after that. What we want to see is passionate disciples of Christ being made and formed and replicating more and more passionate followers of Jesus. But what I do realize is that we can't continue to use our traditional discipleship methods and evangelism methods to accomplish that because as we've seen from, from previous slides, it's not working. So with remaining sound biblically, with remaining really rooted and grounded in the word of God, not compromising that, how can we really look at some of the structures and things differently to affect change in our current society and the upcoming generations? This brings me to my next point structural liberation. 
we are really looking at shifting into a decentralized network of autonomous and multiplying spiritual communities. Now, there's a lot of big words in there, but let me try to break it down for, for what this really means. If you think about uh, the way that we currently do church, it's, it's fairly centralized. Every, uh, all the donations go into one place. Uh, there's a group of leaders that largely kind of have, I'll use the word control, it might not be the best word, but, but basically facilitate the ministry and the outer working of the church. What we're wanting to see is we're wanting to see a way where we can really walk out what I believe Jesus really wanted and what we see at the beginning of book in the book of Acts of everybody playing an integral part in the ministry, in the church. Each one of us is equipped in so many different ways, and we don't want to just consolidate power within a few people. We want to be able to spread that out and equip and empower people to really live the gospel in their daily life and to, to really see change happen. A lot of times that's just not quite possible with the way things currently are built. The structure itself has some limiting factors, and so we want to just shake this up. We want to see within the context of Scripture how we can shift things so that we are empowering people to walk in their own destinies to be able to change the world. And lastly, I want to look at is, is supernatural devotion, prioritizing intimacy with Jesus and the supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit to transform hearts and minds. And this is really where I think the, the history that Sarah and I and our family have developed with the House of Prayer is going to be crucial because what we're not advocating for here is just a ministry of doing. We want to be a ministry of being before God, like Mary of Bethany, who sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word. And what did Jesus say to her? He said, well, he was talking to Martha, really, what, what Mary's doing, it won't be taken away from her. It is the better part. And so we want to embrace this concept of deep devotion, intimacy, prayer, fasting, connecting with God, really loving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength as one of the primary assignments of planting this church. Not something that's kind of off to the side and fun to do as a side program. No, it, making this part of the identity of what we are doing and what we are planting. Now, another question that we get asked, and it's fair, especially if you haven't watched any of the previous videos to ask this question, is why Phoenix? Well, I have gone into a lot more detail on why Phoenix in previous episodes, but to make it short, divine inspiration. The Lord, after I returned back from Poland and the Ukraine, specifically really highlighted to Sarah and I to begin exploring what it would look like to move to Phoenix. And we didn't have very much connection with Phoenix, so it was pretty out of the blue for us. But as you'll see in previous uh, videos, if you want to look into more detail, God confirmed it in really powerful ways and really connected us with another team that was wanting to plant a church in the same location as us, the same expression of church as us. It was just a beautiful kind of divine inspiration thing. And another thing is the sociological potential that is found in Phoenix. Phoenix is a young, growing city. I believe right now they're the fifth largest city in America. But it's known for innovation. You've got Arizona State University, which is a thriving college campus, and, and people are looking at things differently there. I've also been doing a little bit more research, and Phoenix is the ninth most unchurched city in America. And so the potential for change and the potential and the, and the great need in this city is there. And so we really think that we are walking into something where God is just primed to move with great power and to see a real awakening take place in the city. All right, so that largely covers what we're planning on doing with the plant in Phoenix. And now I want to turn our attention to what we've been doing over the past few years, and that is this online discipleship platform that we have now renamed and rebranded as Revive and Awaken. And really, this is, this is the heart of the ministry. Our passion is to freely provide Bible-saturated training resources designed to equip and inspire believers to love God and multiply disciples of Jesus. That's the heart of what we want to do. We want to get this out into as many hands as possible. We want to break off the limitations of, of needing to pay for it for some people that can't afford it. And we want to just spread the message of Jesus, spread the, the, the truths about how to disciple people into the hands of everyday people. And really, this is also a deliberate move to reach our young people, which brings up the next question that we have, which is, what do you think is the average amount of time that millennials and Gen Zers spend online each day?
Well, for some, this result will surprise you. Others, I think you probably would expect it. But here's the answer. Eight and a half hours per day, millennials engage with online content. And now we go to the next generation, Generation Z. It jumps to 10.6 hours daily engaging with online content. These these figures are staggering for what is happening. Uh, the, the, the shift of how we are consuming knowledge, the shift of how we're just basically living our day-to-day lives has changed. And so this has brought about a need not only to be missionaries face-to-face with people on the ground, but also digital missionaries, people that are engaging and really spreading the message of Christ online which is why we have really sought to expand our outreach online. And here's just a few of the things that we're currently doing. We have our our YouTube channel, Facebook page, website. We post online articles every two weeks. There's multiple PDF and Kindle books that we have. All of our PDF books are free. Everything on the website is free. We've got digital courses. We're hoping to release uh, a podcast within the next year or two. And then we're also really uh, experimenting with a private social network and really at the beginning stages of thinking and, and considering what that could look like. So here's just a little bit of statistics, I guess, to, to show you where we're at currently with this ministry. Right now we have nine books and ebooks on the website, six courses available, 199 videos and 17 articles, and those numbers will just continue to grow. I, I'm putting this in here basically to show that that we are are having traction and 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 we have a track record of of continuing to do this. A lot of people can start a YouTube channel, a lot of people can start a website, but do they continue to remain faithful? And that's just what I'm hoping that you're able to see here. All right, for our YouTube data, this is where we're at currently, uh, 20,000 total video views with 1,200 hours of watch time. Now, for those of you who are are understanding of the YouTube world, That's not a ton. We're growing. We continue to expect God to move on this. But it is amazing to sit back and think that there was 1,200 hours that people were investing their time in Christ-centered content that is hopefully building and strengthening their faith. Now, I won't spend too long uh, here. I'll I'll let you guys read this on your own time. But here's just some testimonies. I I really get excited about these because this is where I get to see the life change actually take place. This first one's really exciting for me. It's actually a homeschool co-op in Idaho that has begun using some of our material. And um, she was just getting... Uh, a little bit anxious when she heard about IV Hop closing down and wanted to make sure that the video content wasn't going away either, which it's not. It's all staying up there. And so that was a really encouraging thing to know that there's there's young people already engaging with this content and seeing some life change. Um, and I'll let you read the other couple on your time if you want to pause this video. Now, I want to end with kind of just explaining the overall structure of what we're doing moving forward. So What we have is Revive and Awaken Ministry. Now, what Revive and Awaken Ministry was, was the Illinois Valley House of Prayer. Here's the really cool thing. What we've decided is that even though the Illinois Valley House of Prayer, as an organization and as an entity with a physical location here in Ottawa, Illinois, is closing down, Sarah, my wife, really felt like God was putting it on her heart for us to take the 501c3 with us. And so we've been in dialogue with our closing council and really talking through this. And we have come to the decision that that we are going to take the 501c3 and transition this ministry. This this IV hop uh, closing down is really not an ending of things. It's a transitioning into something new. And so we will keep that 501c3 platform. We're turning it into Revive and Awaken Ministry. And what that basically is going to do is going to encompass all of the ministry that Sarah and I do. Primarily at this stage, it's going to look like the Phoenix Church Plant, and it's also going to look like the Revive and Awaken Discipleship Platform. But God's going to do plenty of other things, I am sure, in our lives. And so we want to just open this up for a way that we can continue to facilitate ministry, that we can receive donations, support, that we can really continue what was started here in Ottawa, Illinois, with the Ottawa Prayer Center that transitioned into the Illinois Valley House of Prayer that is now transitioning into Revive and Awaken. And so that is a little bit of an overview of of what God has for us right now, 2022 heading into 2023. I want to open up myself to any questions, anything that you guys want to, to share. So if you have any questions, if there's anything that you would like to connect about, look in the description below. I have my email there please reach out to me and I would love to be able to answer. But until then, I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to watch this video. 
And I hope it blessed you and gave you a little bit more of an understanding of how God is leading me and our family in this upcoming season. Thanks.